call this meeting to order. I'd like to ask brothers and sisters that smoke if you need to step outside, please. I'm going to introduce myself. My name is Marvin Kane. I'm president of Ask Me Local 444, which is the sponsor of this meeting. And also we have a special guest, Brother Tony Mazaki, International Secretary Treasurer of the Oil, Chemical, and Atomic Workers. And some brief ground, ground rules as to how this meeting will take place. We're going to have Brother Miller to come up and introduce himself and also introduce Brother Mazaki. Brother Mazaki will make his presentation and after his presentation, if you have any questions or any answers that you want addressed, would you hold your questions and answers until the end? We'll have a space at the end for discussion. Right now, Brother Miller. OK, can everybody hear all right? Are the sounds OK and everything? OK. Well, I think, first of all, I'd like to offer my thanks to my union, AFSCME Local 444. That's the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees. It's a great union. It was founded in about 1960, 62. And also, the, my, I'd like to thank the officers of my union and its members and all the unions uh, in AFSCME and other trade unions that have helped to publicize and to sponsor uh, this meeting. One other thing I'd like to do, also in, in preparing for this meeting, I've discovered that many people, uh, particularly those of uh, younger workers and people that aren't active in the trade union movement, uh, are not quite familiar, are not fully familiar with what the question of a Labour Party is. And, as, and the, I just want to explain for those, perhaps some of the younger workers, that in America, the working people do not have a political party of our own. In all the other countries, in the industrialized world, uh, um, working people have their own parties which are based or rooted in the trade unions. And uh, that well, the discussion tonight is about that topic. So I just want to make a, have a, give a brief introduction to this meeting. And I think that perhaps there can be found no better indication of the importance of this meeting than the recent uh, political developments that have uh, uh, the, concerning the Lincoln thrift, which is part of this whole savings and loan industry. This man, Keating, who owned uh, Lincoln thrift, raised $1.4 million for five senators. When asked if the money raised bought him influence, he said, and I quote, the honest man that he is, I want to say in the most forceful way I can, I certainly hope so. <laughs> People involved in the Keating affair were Duke Majin, who received $189,000, Greenspan, who I believe is chairman of the Federal uh, Reserve, worked for him. He influenced the appointment of regulators to the saving and loan uh, industry. And of course, you're all very familiar with perhaps the cleanest politician of all, Mr. Cranston, who was involved also in this whole debacle. Also, sons of politicians who have been involved in the SNL industry, uh, Bush's son, Cranston's son, the son of Mario Cuomo, and I think that just points to the fact that the whole spectrum of the, the two political parties is from the left to the right, the, the right to the so-called left is just riddled and influenced by big business. Um, as the flyers for this meeting state, the USA is the only advanced capitalist country where working people have no political party of their own, rooted in the trade unions. Yet the question of independent political action is constantly raised if we look back at our great history. All the great struggles of the past when US workers took to the offensive are accompanied by movements for independent political action. In the great struggles for better conditions, particularly the eight hour day movement of 1884 to 1886, labor parties were formed in response to brutal attacks by the employers, their courts, and their political parties. And under the initiative of the New York Central Labor Union in 1886, the United Labor Party was formed. 
during the preparations for the New York municipal elections, I think about seven weeks prior to those elections. And despite widespread bribery and fraud by the two parties of big business, the Labour Party polled 31% of the votes. In fact, Labour journalist John Swinton wrote at the time, and I quote, that the new political force struck an astounding blow against the huge machines of both capitalist parties, supported by the combined force of Wall Street, the press, and the city, state, and national government. Swinton pointed out at the time that this new force produced more results than the balance of power politics of the past, with big business responding to the threat with a series of reforms. The success of the Labour Party in New York was followed by a torrent of new Labour parties in many industrial centres. Chicago, for example, a Labour Party adherents got 10 members elected to the Legislative Assembly of the state. Milwaukee received a Labour mayor, and other members were elected to state offices and to the US Congress itself. So from these attempts, to the movement around Eugene Debs, who in, uh, ran for president on the Socialist Party ticket in 1912 and 1920, receiving one million votes each time. He would, ran in the second time from his prison cell. Uh, to the tremendous support for a Labour Party in the 1930s and 40s. This tendency toward independent political action is present in US history. The three great strikes in 1934, the great general strikes of, uh, of Minneapolis, San Francisco and Toledo were followed by the sit-down movement of 1936 and 1937. And at its height, half a million American workers occupied over a thousand workplaces. By the mid-1940s, union membership had increased fivefold in the 15-year period from the, uh, the 1930, the onset of the Depression. And of course, those of us that are aware, the UAW and the CIO were, became a reality. And we mustn't forget that General Motors, which owned countries at the time, said to the American workers, you will never have a union. Well, they got a union, and it wasn't given to them. So we can imagine what that period was like. In 1937, opinion polls showed 21% of the population favored the formation of a Labour Party. And in 1940, John L. Lewis, the, uh, one of the founders of the CIO and the leader of the United Mine Workers, one of the United Mine Workers leaders, came out against President Roosevelt politically. And a few days later, after taking this position, was to have a radio broadcast, gave a radio broadcast. And it's estimated that 25 to 30 million listeners tuned in to hear what they hoped would be a call for a Labour Party. But in a disastrous decision, which affects the life of every US worker today, Lewis supported the Republicans, Wendell Wilkie. Were that mistake not made, American workers today, US workers, would most likely have their own political party and also, uh, just as an example, a National Health Service. That decision blocked the development, uh, helped to block the development of an independent political party in America. And it wasn't only the trade union leaders and Lewis, but also the Communist Party at that time, which I think had some 100,000 members, also supported Roosevelt and blocked the development of independent political action on behalf of American workers. <coughs> Even here in, uh, in the Bay Area, San Francisco had a Labour mayor in 1903. And just to give an example, there was a struggle for the closed shop in 1903, and they tried to call out the employers, went to the mayor to call out the, play, the uh, guard, and he refused. Uh, the, the, uh, also in Oakland, uh, after the, there was a general strike in Oakland in 1946, late 1946, 200,000 workers took to the streets of Oakland. Crime decreased, like it always, do, like it always does when workers fight. Uh, and in following that general strike in May, there were city council elections in Oakland. There was a mass labor rally at the Civic Auditorium where five independent candidates, independent candidates were endorsed. And these candidates clearly based themselves on the labor movement. And despite massive attacks by the press of big business, red baiting, accusations of anarchy and communism, corruption, all sorts of filth and lies, and, uh, and uh, attacks. Despite all these attacks, four out of the five of these candidates were elected. This was the effect that the general strike had on the political environment in Oakland at the time. Now, these candidates, candidates, however, were not clearly and consciously put forward by the labor movement. They came to the labor movement. And because of this, and also their lack of a clear program, they were unable to maintain their independence once elected. So, brothers and sisters, many people say 
And uh, I've, been, I've been active in the labour movement around here for 12, 15 years, and I visit many picket lines, and I talk to workers in my workplace and on picket lines, and many people say that it's not the time for a Labour Party. However, I, I, don't, I don't think I recall anybody, whether a Labour leader or a rank-and-file union member, that opposes a Labour Party. They say it's not the time, particularly the Labour uh, leadership will often say it's not the time. But if we look at the last 15 years, US workers' real wages have fallen 15%. In 1973, it took 20% of a median family income to carry a home mortgage. In 1986, it took 51%. Only a third of our unemployed receive any benefits at all. And some 40 million people, some people say as high as 80 million, if you include, uh, well, some, I've read some figures that say 80 million. But certainly some 40 million people in the United States have no health insurance. And perhaps one of the most crushing indictments of our political system is that between 1986 and 1988, the life expectancy of black Americans actually decreased. This is not in the Congo, this is in, Af it is in the United States of America, that the life expectancy of a whole section of our population goes down in the most powerful uh, country that's ever existed on the planet. So I believe that this meeting is important in, in light of the present economic situation. American workers are taking these cuts, we mustn't forget, brothers and sisters, in a boom. This is the longest boom in peacetime history. We're taking cuts in a boom, in an economic upswing. And an up upswing, incidentally, based purely on speculation and credit. In the last 10 weeks, I saw a report, I think it was in the Wall Street Journal just yesterday, or the day, uh, just in the last few days, um, 100,000 workers have been laid off in the last 10 weeks. Also, this subject tonight, the sub this question that, uh, that we're going to we're gonna, uh, hear, this subject continues, we must remember, it's hard for us sometimes because it's so hidden, but it continues the tradition within the US labor movement, and I've tried to touch on that with just a few examples I gave, continues the tradition of the, uh, of the ongoing struggle for independent political action, that this is not the first time this has been discussed in the American labor movement, as I tried to show very briefly. So brothers and sisters, uh, with that, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker tonight, I'm working out of class now. I've been added some new tasks. So before I, um, before I introduce the guest speaker, we have two international uh, uh, statements, letters of support for this meeting. One of them is from the Southern African Labor Education Project. These are brothers and sisters inside and outside South Africa. Local 444 has helped them, written to them, invited them here. They work inside and outside South Africa for the tra to build the trade unions and to the end to apartheid. And I'd like to read that to you. Message to the Conference on the Formation of a Labour Party, 12th of December 1989. The Southern African Labour Education Project, SALEP, sends fraternal greetings to your conference discussing the establishment of a Labour Party in the USA. We are inspired by this bold initiative as the independent voice of the American working class means another step forward for the working class worldwide. We are pleased this conference is sponsored by AFSME Local 444, which is a proud record of supporting workers in struggle throughout the world. The campaign around the release of Palestinian trade unionist Mahmoud Massara, the marvelous fighting campaign around the release of Moses Mayakiso, the South African trade union leader, shows the true meaning of workers, workers internationalism. Like you have stood beside us, we stand with you in your fight against exploitation by the bosses. Go forward and build the Labour Party, workers of all countries unite, from the Southern African Labour Education Project. We have one other statement from the uh, British Parliament, signed by 10 Labour Party MPs. It says, Dear brothers and sisters, we have heard about your meeting on Tuesday the 12th of December to lay the basis for the formation of a great party of, for a party of Labour in the United States of America. We wish to send our warm fraternal greetings to this very important meeting of trade unionists. The formation of a US Party of Labour would be a huge step forward for workers in your country and for the Labour movement throughout the whole world. We wish you every success and look forward to uniting together in the fight to end the brutal rule of the bosses once and for all. Yours in solidarity and is signed by 10, 10 British Labour Party MPs. So with that, brothers and sisters, I'd like to introduce uh, the next speaker. And he's, a, he's a, a trade unionist who has been in the trade union min movement. I've had an opportunity to spend the last couple of days taking him around and being with him. He spent 43 years of his life in the trade union movement. Uh, I believe it uh, originated in, in the, uh, the CIO, predominantly in industrial unions. So he's had many, many years' experience. 
and I think uh, I'd like to thank him for coming and like to introduce uh, Brother Anthony Mazzocchi of the, uh, he's the International Secretary Treasurer of the Oil, Chemical and Atomic Workers Union, where he will tonight express his views on the question of a Labour Party in the United States. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Richard. Um, I'm not here to announce the formation of a Labour Party, but to carry on a discussion that uh, I think some familiar faces in the audience that I see, uh, a number of us have been engaged in this discussion for any number of years. I certainly uh, have been agitating around the question for uh, quite a few years. Uh, I do think uh, the time uh, now is more appropriate to uh, escalate a discussion on a need for a Labour Party. And that, that's essentially, I wonder if we could close that door, just getting a lot of background sound that's the strength. I'm here really to carry on this discussion and I, I would hope that it is a discussion, and it's essentially a discussion I wish to have with trade unionists. Uh, I have, um, want to be very explicit about that. This is my proposals uh, at the present time affect the trade union community, and although I know there are people in here who are not members of the trade union community, certainly welcome to participate in the discussion, but I want to put my own discussion in context. It's a discussion I think trade, union, trade unionists must initially engage in before uh, the question of the establishment of a, a Labour Party uh, is proposed in any realistic fashion. I think uh, discussions of this sort have to take place throughout the United States and indeed have been taking place. But um, I uh, perceive or, and conceive that a party, uh, and I'll explain the type of party I think uh, we should be discussing, has to be rooted in and among uh, organized trade unionists as a start. I think uh, organizing a party is serious business. Uh, it's a formidable task. I know there are many union organizers in the audience. Uh, I first cut my teeth giving out leaflets in front of a DuPont plant over 43 years ago, and that plant is still unorganized. So uh, when you talk about organizing a party, it's a much more formidable task than organizing a giant like DuPont. And I don't think one enters uh, a task like this frivolously. I've had, I've uh, engaged in any number of labor struggles like many of you have. I know what the ashes of defeat taste like. I've been uh, involved in uh, being uh, beat badly by the bosses. And I have great respect for the power of the bosses. And uh, I also have great respect uh, for the power of uh, the, uh, the press that essentially controlled by the bosses. So these are serious discussions. And that the timeline I see is not a short timeline, but like everything else in life, and certainly those of us uh, who have uh, looked at the events in Eastern Europe recently understand that sometimes history moves faster than any of us could imagine. Uh, and I think working people always have to be prepared to take advantage of uh, those moments in history that allow us to, to move ahead in, in leaps and bounds. So although uh, I think we ought to be sober and cautious and serious in these discussions, we must also be aware that uh, there, are, there are events unleashing themselves, and Richard Turn talked about some of them, that I think will affect timelines. Uh, so I'm not rooted to any particular timeline. Also, I've grown, I guess, to understand the Chinese view of history, long, long view of history. Uh, when I was very young, I uh, came out of the army at the end of World War II, and I remember being at a meeting similar to this, and I forget what we were talking about, but uh, someone mentioned in 20 years they thought we would have achieved whatever it was that we were talking about that evening, and I recall that I said, my God, 20 years. Uh, I really thought that I was looking for something to happen tomorrow in five years' time. But uh, 43 years later, I've learned to understand that uh, time runs out rather fast. Events sometimes happen 
rapidly and sometimes slowly. And uh, I'd like to talk uh, a little about my own history because uh, uh, my perceptions are formed by my own experience, my own history, which certainly mirror that of uh, others in the post-war generation. I came into this labor movement uh, when I left the Army. I went to work in an automobile factory, and uh, it, it taught me about work. I'm not one of, I'm not a proponent of work. I, I always make that clear. I think work in our society is lousy, and uh, although we have to work, uh, I never did like it very much. Uh, and if I uh, I did escape work by becoming a labor bureaucrat early on, and um, I, I think work can be useful. I think work uh, can be fulfilling, uh, and that's a dream I have, that someday work will be fulfilling and um, satisfying. But uh, I worked on an automobile assembly line in 1946, I think it was Ford Motor Company in Edgewater, New Jersey, making 59 cars an hour and uh, working as fast as my little legs and arms could carry me. And uh, my vision of work uh, changed from that time. Um, so uh, <clears throat> I understood that, uh, that it was the job of trade unions to civilize work, uh, that it was the job of trade unions to uh, fulfill a vision of a shorter work week, of humane working conditions where workers had control over their lives at the point of production, and that's a power. Uh, I always remember walking into that plant and uh, remember being reduced from uh, uh, an adult to a child, uh, raised my hand to go to the bathroom, waited for a relief man, and all uh, the indignities that are imposed upon us at work. And we had a good union. The UAW was a fighting union. And that was a time when uh, we didn't even have a grievance procedure. If we didn't uh, like uh, what happened that day at work, we didn't work the next day. And that's how we resolve uh, problems. But, and I recall the strike wave of 48. My own union uh, uh, was a leader here in California. And of course, I recall uh, the struggle to uh, fight the implementation of the Taft-Hartley Act. I was in New York City, which was a union town. And we put near a million people in the street, all streets, all trade unionists. In those days, we called a meeting. Uh, I remember myself at a central labor body that was packed to the rafters, which they always were. And we're fighting over the minimum wage, and I called for a shop stewards meeting citywide. And, we, and it wasn't surprising, you know, we filled Madison Square Garden just with, sh with shop stewards. 25,000 shop stewards came out to a meeting uh, at the garden. We filled it. Uh, in those days, you could do that. Uh, it was tremendous union consciousness. Uh, it, uh, those of you who are around recall it. Uh, uh, cities were union towns. We, we had a tremendous impact on uh, society. Um, unions were viewed as a social movement. Uh, unions were viewed as, as crusaders uh, for the advancement of the interest of uh, working pe all people uh, at that time. And I recall in those days that um, we, to be a scab, to be a scab was um, something uh, that everyone considered to be a sign of uh, about the worst description of a human being one could uh, make. And uh, uh, scabs' lives, I know in my own local union, uh, 30 years later, people still didn't talk to some of the scabs who walked through the picket line. And that situation has changed. I think everybody's experienced. You, you'll find that in certain instances. But that was the prevailing rule. Consciousness was very high among working people. And you know, in those days, when we had strikes, we would go out to uh, a facility that was receiving us the goods that we were striking. You know, we'd, we'd be striking a plant, and uh, the supervisor would be turning out work. We would just pick it, the recipient of those goods. And no one even if they were non-union labor, they wouldn't handle struck goods. Uh, that was a very powerful tool we had. And people related to that. Now, that wasn't uh, universal, but essentially, we had a great deal of power. We had a sense of our own power. And uh, solidarity just wasn't a meaningless expression. It meant something. People, uh, even those workers who were non-union. Uh, then uh, the Taft-Otley Act was passed, and uh, 
secondary boycotts are outlawed, uh, a whole host of uh, restrictions were imposed upon trade unions. And um, we sort of complied with those restrictions. I'm not going to review the whole history of the Cold War and its impact on trade unions, but essentially there was declining consciousness. Uh, unions began to uh, lose uh, their influence. Uh, I recall uh, in 1955 I was a delegate at the last convention of the CIO in Manhattan Center in New York and we were voting on uh, a merger with the AFL and at that time we represented 35 percent of the workforce in this country and that 35 percent uh, wasn't just 35 percent of all the workers which it was we represented uh, the most vital sections of this society. Uh, we represented the majority, over, well, almost totally all the steel workers, all the auto workers, uh, you name the trades. And we were pretty preponderant as uh, an entity in American life. Uh, we were a powerful uh, political presence. Uh, uh, people, any poll taken at that time, labor was considered uh, it was very elevated in uh, the esteem of the American people. People perceived it as a force for social good and social advancement. And then began, began this very slow uh, decline uh, in uh, the, our ability to attract some of the best and brightest minds that we used to attract to this movement. Uh, then I think uh, the way I can describe the movement today is that Working workers uh, perceive us, I think, if we wish to be honest. Uh, of course, any description I make is not meant to be absolutely universal, but I think it, it represents uh, certainly the majority of situations. I think working people feel very impotent and powerless, and they look at their, uh, they look at, uh, they're cynical too. They view institutions, uh, unions, bosses, the government is screwing them. I think that uh, stated or unstated, there's this feeling out there, and they feel unions are sort of powerless to uh, uh, struggle successfully against the bosses. Now, I'm the first to, uh, and I think I, uh, my own history is of pointing out our deficiencies, and certainly I felt and I feel that um, a trade union movement that's worthy of its name should be open to debate about its inadequacies. It should be vigorous in arguing constantly. Uh, I, I usually characterize my talks as I uh, come here to, to start an argument, and I thought that was normally our role. I think we can learn a lot by arguing with each other. But uh, a lot of our problems certainly are not of our own making, and we have a lot of problems in the trade union movement. Certainly the globalization of the economy uh, has a great deal uh, to do with our powerlessness. I know what it is to deal with multinational companies. I've dealt with them all my working life. And uh, I know what it is to sit across the bargaining table with a company that uh, sales exceed the gross national product of every country in the world but eight. That's, you know, a description of an oil company. And that's power. Uh, and a power not to be able to shut them down. And if you do sh strike, and we've struck some facilities for a year straight, and uh, not shut off an ounce of product because uh, the companies are highly rationalized, automated, uh, they certainly are able to uh, move their profit center around, bring in uh, product from abroad. Now, you all experience uh, this type of power. I mean, you confront it constantly. So now we're a movement of uh, being a secretary treasurer and having lied about our membership for so many years, I really almost forget what our true membership is because in, 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 in public I usually, uh, in Always, I think the cardinal rule for trade unionists is when you're asked, you always multiply by two. Uh, and, but I, I, would, I would suspect that uh, we're probably down to about 12 to 13 percent of the workforce organized. And uh, in those vital sectors, uh, in, in many areas, we've seen some of the vital sectors totally exported. I mean, the number of steel workers, the number of auto, well, auto, auto is still a pr pretty uh, potent force, but even that is declining. We've seen whole industries disappear. So our strength has uh, um, been uh, greatly diminished. And 
you know, we're getting down to the numbers we had in the Great Depression before we had that tremendous upsurge called the birth of the CIO. And, but we're, we're probably um, much more uh, sound in the area of resources. We have incredible resources in this movement still. We have skills. I, I must admit that when I entered this movement, uh, we had a lot of guts and brawn, and um, we had advantages. You hear a lot of old-timers talk about their organizing skills. We were a lot, probably lousy organizers. But what we had, we had a consciousness and we had a movement. Most people were organized over the back fence. You went into a town to organize, and neighbors would say, oh, the OCAW, we weren't called OCAW, but whatever union it was, they're in town organizing. People would say, hey, listen, you ought to join a union. Your neighbors would tell you because they said, the union's done wonders for us at the work site. And uh, now I know it's a lot of times organizers come in and say, hey, don't tell anybody, uh, uh, it, you know, what you're doing because uh, somebody who belongs to the union may badmouth the union. It's a whole different mood and a whole different sense uh, that exists. So, but I know that organizers are sharper today. I think the skills of organizers are much sharper today. So this movement has some incredible assets and resources, lesser in numbers. It's got some money that it never had. And it's got a hell of a lot of skills. So I see a lot of young people with terrific abilities. I'm always impressed, even in losing organizing campaigns, uh, about the innovativeness and creativeness of a lot of the organizers. So by one, on one hand, we're, we've grown weaker. On another hand, um, we've got some tremendous assets. If we mobilize them for uh, uh, proper purposes, I think we could uh, make the type of waves that haven't, seen in, haven't been seen in America for a long time. Now, it, I don't intend to uh, describe the gripes I have with the political process, but just briefly. I mean, Richard uh, described a number of them. I think, um, I think American workers are uh, pretty analytical without thinking it. Uh, I, I travel in a lot of uh, labor circles where I hear uh, a lot of the leadership bemoan the fact that workers, American workers, don't vote. And they don't. I mean, but I think that's a sign of the sophistication of American workers. Because what they, have, what they are saying is, and I think they're saying it very clearly, it doesn't matter. 50% of the people now say it doesn't matter. I noticed with great interest in Eastern Europe, in uh, countries that are now having elections for the first time, there's a place on a ballot, none of the above. And American workers have been voting none of the above in increasing numbers. And they're now at 50%. I know that that 50% has been described by some people as the third party, the third party of the non-voter. It's a very powerful force out there that if they decided to uh, enter the political electoral process and voted, uh, they would tip the scales in either a progressive direction or in a direction that most of us would not agree with who sit in this room. I think there's a whole reservoir of people out there ready to respond to a clarion call by someone who begins to address their interests, their economic interests, and that clarion call could come from someone who is demagogic and can lead people down a road that uh, could lead to the type of ugliness in this society that uh, I know that everybody here uh, rejects. And they're also ready to follow those who uh, uh, lay out a path that makes sense, uh, that would advance the interests of the American people. I think there's this tremendous reservoir of people sitting on their hands because they say what exists doesn't represent their best interests. I happen to share that sentiment to an appreciable degree that uh, the political system now has been totally captured by corporations. And it's not a secret. I mean, the right wing in this country clearly, clearly uh, describes their position of being a, a movement that 
is attempting to control the political agenda. And they've done that very successfully. So you have a situation where uh, savings and loan goes belly up, and in Congress, uh, there's a fight on in Congress. And not, there's not a fight on savings and loan anymore. They've decided to bail out uh, probably up to $300 billion, if that's the ultimate amount. I noticed I left New Jersey the other day in the biggest savings and loan collapse the Fed's moved in. Uh, the initial count is that they're on belly up for $7 billion. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm a, as I said, I'm not a proponent of work. I still maintain the program the labor movement should be forget jobs. We should look out for income. Uh, jobs will take care of themselves. And boy, I'd love to have that $300 billion uh, to institute a program that I was a beneficiary of beneficiary of one time. You know, I'm always incredulous at people when I say, look, we ought to go for income, not jobs, because I don't believe jobs are possible in this society right now. I think we need a transition. I think we've got to take care of nature, the environment. Uh, we've got to switch over to a uh, different type of work. And I remember when I came out of the Army at the end of World War II, there was, there was like 16 million of us who had to be demobilized. And this society understood you can't demobilize 16 million uh, ar uh, formerly armed people who had uh, been involved in combat in every corner of the earth and say, uh, hey, listen, you're going to fend for yourselves. Uh, you know, I, we all were given 52 weeks pay to do what the hell we wanted. We used to, we characterize this 5220 club for those of you, I see some people here as old as I am, and you remember we called it the 5220 club. You were given $52 a week at 60% of what the average wage was at that time. And that's without any taxes taken out. And uh, what was it? 20, that's what I said, 52, 20, 52 weeks at 20 bucks a week, which was 60% of the average wage. And uh, a lot of us went to work for a few months and took time off, and we stretched out that period of transition. Those who wanted to go to school, their tuition was paid, they were given wages, uh, they were given child support. Uh, you know, uh, tremendous federal money was put up. And it was an incredible task of, uh, of demobilizing uh, all these people, and then a gradual transition to a peaceful economy. And, you know, I'm always incredulous when I see people sleeping on the streets because uh, hordes of people got married at that time instantaneously and families were sprouting up. Those of you who remember 1946 and 1947, you saw, I grew up in a depression, I barely saw a baby carriage and came uh, 46 and 47. And I guess baby carriages were the biggest uh, industry in America. And you know, we threw up Quonset huts, uh, we housed families. Uh, you know, we, we utilized the resources this society had, had available because uh, during the war, uh, there was agitation for a, a political program that would deal with this transition. And the CIO and the AFL at the time were behind it. We called it the GI Bill of Rights. And, I, and I've been describing what the GI Bill of Rights is, and I called it, I didn't call it the GI Bill of Rights, and people say, you're never going to get that. And I said, well, you know, I lived through a period when we got that. And uh, we got things that, you, you know, we, we educated a whole generation of people, uh, many of your parents are in here. And uh, we did it overnight. So uh, I know the ability uh, to mobilize society when uh, you have a political perspective and you have a political apparatus that can do that. Now, I think we're at the point in our history where uh, people have rejected the existing political parties. They're not voting. The political parties are demonstrating that they, and they describe themselves. I noticed the Democratic Leadership Conference recently, Senator Robb, talking about uh, the Democrats have to come back to the middle. I always thought that's where they were, but they're going to come back to the middle. And that... Uh, They've got to develop a program that is fiscally responsible, uh, that uh, is heavy on defense. Uh, that's where the American people are, they say. Uh, that they can't cater to special interests, which means the interest of organized labor and its constituency working people. They are describing the parameters of the program that they want to operate within. So the bosses. Uh, can't lose. Corporate America can't lose. They've got the Republicans who have an out, outright uh, business philosophy. We have the Democrats who have moved toward that particular philosophy. And the right wing who decided not to play in the electoral arena from 1964 after they lost the election 
have developed a cadence in this country that says you need to walk down a corporation path that if you don't give money to corporations, somehow it's going to trickle down to us. And they not only talk about it, they institute these policies. The glaring examples, um, you know, the tax on capital gains that they want to revise. They want to shift more money from the bottom to the top. Uh, the, the shackling of uh, the labor movement. It's very difficult to do anything these days. Uh, the, the miners uh, have had over a trillion dollars in fines levied against them in their struggle with the Pittston Coal Company, a life and death struggle with the Pittston Coal Company. A governor that that union supported for election was the first one to call out the National Guard or the state police uh, to suppress uh, their aspirations for uh, a good contract. Uh, in any struggle where workers are pitted against the bosses, uh, politicians either say, we have to be neutral, and we can't intervene. After all, we represent all people. And I always thought that uh, when we helped elect someone, I, didn't want, I don't want a politician to represent everybody. If we support them, I want them to represent me and the people I represent. Uh, that's why I solicit my members for money uh, for the campaign. I want them to represent me. And Americans feel like that. I, the, the thing that encouraged me the most in the, when Jesse Jackson was waging his campaign and began to express populist issues, uh, held a lot of people responded uh, to his call. Uh, I mean, what, nine or 10 million people voted in primaries for a man who was laying out a hard economic line that directly appealed to the interest of working people. Now, I think it's time for a party that will begin to advance the interest of all the American people with some bold programs. Uh, because what are the options for Americans today? This is the first, gener this is the first time in the post-war history that there's another perception that I see that's been developed by working people. When I came into the workforce, and for many years, most workers felt, hell, work was lousy and it was hard, but you know, wages were getting better. We were improving conditions. But it was certainly going to be better for our children. That was always what drove us in the workplace. This is the first time in the entire post-war period that I, where workers will now say, my kids aren't going to have it as good as me. This is a whole new dimension. This is a whole new environment where people understand that. And in my union, which is like any other union, we, we uh, as an industrial union, when an oil refinery lays off or shuts down, 95% of those workers will not find a job at the wages and conditions they earned while they were working under a union contract in that industry. Along the Texas Gulf Coast, we've lost thousands of workers in many other areas. And the record shows 95% will earn substantially less. And when you go from 18 bucks an hour, $17 an hour, and have to go to work at less than $5 an hour, that's a that's a dramatic change in the nature of your life, and that's, that's what confronting many American workers. You lose a job in the auto industry or any of the jobs that many of you enjoy or once enjoyed. The future is rather bleak. And what's the program? What's the program for American workers? Now, what program is uh, addressing the fact that uh, uh, there's a great deal to be done in this society? Uh, but that there are people openly expressing the fact that our wages should be reduced to those of uh, third world countries. They don't even subtly talk about that. You can find direct expressions saying, we got to get wages down here to be competitive. And anytime you compete with wages, you're going to uh, go down to the wages of uh, a buck an hour, two bucks an hour, three bucks an hour. There's no way we can compete on wages. And we once were proud of the fact that we, we were a movement based on the notion that you took wages out of competition, you leveled off wages wherever you went. If you worked in Birmingham, Alabama, or, or in New York, you got the same wage for the same work. That's fast disappearing. So there's, there's a general perception out there that no one has an answer for working people's problems. And the answers that the political parties have is that you've got to tighten your belt and you've got to take less because we've got to compete with everybody and their grandmother, and there's no way we can do that. What we need is. Uh, we, we, we need cooperation rather than competition. Uh, we need solidarity rather than being pitted against one another. So I, I propose that it's time to 
begin to consider a structure that can deal with this. A party, uh, my, my proposal is that uh, forming a party in this country, which is not a parliamentary system, is, uh, first of all, uh, organize uh, working people through their representatives. And working people who form a new party, and I propose a Labor Party, have to define what they wish to stand for. And I'm absolutely opposed to a few of us holding up in a room and drawing up a, a, a manifesto and coming out and say, listen, this is what's good for everybody, and this is what we propose. I think what we propose has to be argued out in halls like this all over America. And that I have no idea what the ultimate program should consist of. I do know that we need an instrument, a party, in order to express it, to provide the space for uh, the arguing out of what that program should be. And I think if we begin to argue what a program should be within a party structure, we'll attract uh, tens of thousands and millions of Americans into a party like that. I think Americans are waiting uh, for such a party. I think it'll be much easier for labor to organize because people say that's a movement that we want to identify with. And that's a movement, even if I can't move the boss, I'm going to be able to be part of a movement that moves the government. Because I tell you very frankly, I don't think you can negotiate with the boss in every instance. And I think we should be negotiating with the state in many instances. The question of insurance, I challenge anybody. I challenge anybody in America, in the trade union, to show me that they can negotiate improvements in their health insurance plans. The entire movement's in retreat. There's no place to go but down. We should be negotiating with the state, the government. We need national health care. Uh, we should be negotiating. We should be negotiating like our Western European brothers. I mean, it's the only country in the world where you enter the workforce and you have to arrange with the boss for your vacations. Christ, I was in Italy recently. A worker walks into the workplace. It's four weeks vacation. It's a state. They've, the working people have negotiated with the state. Here we have all sorts of absentee control programs being imposed. You know, if you're absent two days or three days, you don't hear of that there because your sick leave is guaranteed by the state. Your insurance is guaranteed by the state. Your vacations are guaranteed by the state. Your holidays are guaranteed by the state. That's out of the bargaining arena. So it's much more, it's easier to struggle against the boss because you've got many rights that are preserved and have been instituted by virtue of workers negotiating with the state. So in order to begin these negotiations, we need a Labor Party. Now, the Labor Party I'm proposing, uh, which uh, creates a hell of a lot of problems with people. I don't think it's possible uh, to form a party and get into an electoral arena. I always tell my friends who want to get elected, I say, you know, be careful. You're liable to get elected. Because what the hell are you going to do when you get elected? What's the program? How are you going to uh, move a program? All you'll do is spread disillusionment and cynicism. People say it's more of the same garbage. It'll be confusion. and um, it'll be a collapse of a movement. I think it takes time before you challenge for power. I think before one runs for an election, they have to have clearly in their mind what they stand for, not as individuals, but as a movement. We have to define that program. So I would propose a party that's non-electoral. It's a party that forms, it's based on congressional districts. We begin to beat out a program. We begin to beat out a program, we begin to articulate this program all over America. And when we're ready to challenge for electoral power, uh, we'll know when that time is. So I think uh, the importance of a meeting like this uh, is that uh, you've got to begin to discuss uh, these options. Uh, I believe there are a million people out there who are ready to join overnight in a party. I think this party has got to be a dues-paying party that uh, people join. It's got to produce its own newspaper that uh, speaks to the truth and uh, speaks to the type of issues and uh, is uh, distributable across the nation as a whole. Uh, we're not going to have the established press establishment uh, voice our story. We need the type of uh, organized movement that is possible to be born overnight because, look, I, I can recall George Wallace getting up and saying there's not a dime's worth of difference between the two parties in attracting tens of millions of people into that party, and he stood for the wrong thing. And there are a lot of people in the wings who stand for the wrong thing, are ready to get out there and say there's not a dime's worth of difference between these parties getting out there to talk to the economic ills of the American people. And I'm, I'm old enough to remember turning on a radio and listening to Hitler and Mussolini 
with the same line and attracted a hell of a lot of people. And uh, they may not be of the same character, it'll have the subtleties of, of the American scene, but I'm convinced that if there's not a third party created by working people, there's going to be a third party created by those who oppose the interests of working people and will be further victimized and uh, powerless to move because that'll be a party bought, be really backed by the force of the state. So for the purpose of this meeting, I would suggest we begin to uh, seriously discuss a party that doesn't engage in electoral politics. My position is I think the American labor movement, most people, uh, who are caught up in electoral politics aren't about to retreat from it tomorrow morning. And I'm saying, look, vote for who you want to vote for. Uh, but alongside of that development has to be the development of a party that begins to beat out a cadence, a cadence that begins to raise issues that strike at the heart of the problem and talk to those workers in the shops, both organized and unorganized, that strike right to where they just intuitively feel uh, is a responsive court. Uh, when you go in and talk to workers about the programs of uh, a national health insurance and uh, uh, shorter work weeks and pay if you don't work, all the type of social programs that I know that you support and uh, speak to it through an organizational structure, we'll begin to even move the established parties because if you expose them for what they are, uh, they're going to have to be responsive. It's a very, even, in, even in the development of a third party of the type I suggest, we'll begin to uh, force the parties to pay attention to the type of proposals uh, I know we're capable of formulating. So, brothers and sisters, uh, I didn't come here to, to make a speech, but really to, uh, uh, to start this uh, national argument. It's not starting here. This type of discussion has been taking place. Uh, but it's escalating. More people are coming out all over the United States, even if nothing to shoot down the idea, they're coming out. Uh, we're pulling them away from their television sets to, to come out and say, hey, something's afoot and something's moving out there. And uh, there are tens of millions of people ready to respond. I don't think people are going to carry to, you know, climb the barricades tomorrow morning. Uh, but um, I think that people are ready for a serious discussion about the need for alternative political options. And with that, uh, certainly uh, I'd like to uh, hear your own views and your own comments and um, uh, uh, whether to uh, not attack, I hate to use that word, but certainly uh, uh, I, I have very thick skin and I don't want anybody to be reticent to uh, take on these ideas. As I said, I've been through enough trade union struggles uh, to understand that uh, nothing comes easy. But uh, the one thing that is important is that we're never afraid to express ourselves in any form that's created for us. Uh, I, I think we can invigorate the trade union movement just by instituting this argument. I'm appalled when I go to union meetings and nobody's there. And nobody's there because there's really nothing to say. I always ask my friends in the trade union movement, what are you complaining about nobody coming out to the union meeting? All I hear is about uh, jo John Jones has this grievance and He's 98,000 on a list, and three years from now, you know, the agreement's going to arbitration. There's this type of dismal discussion that takes place, and uh, I don't know what you would tell people if they all came out to a union meeting at once, but if we had a vigorous program to discuss, a new direction to discuss, a program that addressed the interest on how to fight the bosses as equals, and to deal with power, and how to achieve power, I think we'd fill the union halls and uh, those union halls will again reverberate like they once did. And that, and that echo that comes out of those union halls will be sound, will be heard throughout America. And with that, uh, brothers, uh, certainly uh, I'm here to uh, respond to your own comments and questions and, in, and being and engaged in the type of discussion that I hope will spread all over the Bay Area. so you can be heard by everybody else. 
with your questions. I'm calling the brother right here. I got a loud enough voice. Uh, yeah, my concern is right now we there is no real mass rank and file movement. You know, we can sit around and talk about the program of a labor party, but without a rank and file movement, uh, we're going to sit around for a long time talking about the program. And I think one of the key things, if we're going to get together in the future, is talking how to build a rank and file movement so that we can build a labor party out of that. Uh, I'd like to mention, in, about 12 years ago in San Francisco, there was a formation called District Labor Committees, where the union started organizing in it, each district, cross-union-wise. Knock on a door, introduce myself in one union, you're in another union. We're going to talk about neighborhood problems, and as well as what the, pro the community needs and what the city needs, not just what the whole nation needs. And we started meeting together in neighborhoods, and we had a labor congress. Some of you were there. About 500 rank and file people were there. And in fact, one of the resolutions of that Congress was for independent political action. That was the last you ever heard about district labor committees and about the whole thing was canceled out by the, local, by the Democratic Party machine. It became a non-event, like it did never even happened or existed. But that was a very important experience, building on a community district level, because we're also, like we were, bringing in wives, uh, kids, the housewives, it wasn't just union members, and that's one thing I'd like to emphasize, that we don't just be formal union members. A lot of people out there don't belong to unions who are workers, but this is going to be broader than just union members who belong to just particular locals. We've got a, there's an experience in Latin America and in South Africa where they brought it, brought in the whole community into the struggles. That is, they brought everybody, the unemployed uh, workers, uh, the, the kids, every part of this struggle. So I, I think, yeah, if the key has to be the labor movement, we can't just restrict it to the labor movement, it has to be a much broader kind of struggle. And then I think when we're discussing uh, issues outside of just uh, the problems facing the labor movement, then we'll start having a rank and file movement. But if it's just us, the 12, 13 percent of the labor movement, we'll be talking for a long time. We've got to bring in 50, 60 percent of the of working people in this country if we really want a real labor movement. Excuse me, I'd like to stay, I didn't state in the beginning here, if, if you wouldn't mind stating your name and, and your local that you belong to if you're in one. Brother in the back there, the glasses. Yes, you. My name is uh, George Cohen. I know some people here. I see some faces. I'm a retired uh, school teacher, member of the AFT. I have a gold card. And I have an article here that was in The Guardian uh, last July 5th by Tony Mazzocchi. It says uh, just one paragraph, about like a comment from him. He says, uh, the first step, therefore, is to form an organizing committee of 20 to 30 national and regional leaders. This committee would agree on an interim statement of purposes that would define the party's direction and methods. It would also charter the state labor party organizing committees and provide them with guidance. Now, I don't know if that's accurate, but that's what Mr. Mazzocchi was quoted as saying in, the, in this newspaper called The Guardian. I wondered if there's any thinking about that calling some kind of thing together so that there can be the establishment of some nucleus to get things started. Um, that quotes me explicitly. That is what I've been proposing. And uh, that plan is the one uh, I'm following series of speaking engagements like this, identify um, those people who are members of organized labor, who we could ultimately call together, who would be willing to uh, set up an interim uh, charter situation in an ultimately uh, worked toward a convention uh, where a party would be formulated and a program begin to uh, be developed. Uh, that's the strategy uh, I've been following, and uh, as I say, it accurately describes 
uh, my proposal, and this is part of that process. It's a, a romp across the United States in trying to identify those particular people. And when they're fully identified and uh, ready, uh, we'll do it. Uh, if it's not, um, we uh, won't have wasted time. I, some others may come up with a better scheme, and I'm prepared to follow any, any, anything that succeeds in uh, addressing those problems that uh, I talked about. Uh, but that's the plan. but an activist in anti-war, anti-apartheid movements, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, a couple of points I want to raise. Um, first of all, it seems that every, virtually every labor and social democratic party in the world that has gotten into office in the last decade has carried out the economic policies uh, of, of the uh, worldwide capitalist class, which is the policy of austerity, policy of attacks on workers. Look at New Zealand, look at France, Greece, Australia, I, I, must, I missed a lot, but I mean, those are the few that come to mind. All these parties carry out the policies of the ruling classes. And then you look at, a, look at another case, a case of the uh, Workers' Party in Brazil, which is probably one of the most internally democratic workers' parties around, um, with its uh, general meetings at the side policy. Nevertheless, when they start trying to get elected and trying to get power within the, the rules of the system, they immediately start adapting to that system and and showing principles and from its formation to be opposed to, to uh, U.S. domination. Um, I think these are issues that have to be addressed. I think it's a good idea to form a party that is not electorally oriented, that is, that is oriented towards uh, getting people together uh, in a some kind of democratic formation where they can decide on actions and hopefully they decide on doing things like uh, the for um, sending masses of people to picket lines, you know, having various direct actions, support of strikes, so on. Uh, but I suspect, I believe, that as soon as a party like that starts trying to get elected, it's going to start adapting to what is determined by the present level of consciousness as, um, as acceptable, and the present level of consciousness as interpreted and shaped by the capitalist media. I mean, I'd like to see these issues addressed. What is going to be happen with this party that's going to make it different from all these other dis um, disastrous examples of uh, labor parties that we've seen so far. Mm -hmm. My name is John Ryman. I'm a member of Carpenters Local 713. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to comment on what Brother Meller was talking about, about the savings and loan crisis. And it's very interesting, I was reading one savings and loan association just a little ways north of here up on the Russian River Centennial. It went bankrupt and uh, there was about a half dozen of the top officers. It turned out that they had built that sa savings and loan for $165 million. One of the people involved did a year in jail and that was it for all of them. Now if you take the average robbery in this country, the average robber in this country nets $631 and if they're caught and convicted, the average prison sentence is over three and a half years. So the lesson to be drawn is clear. You draw, steal $165 million, you get away scot-free. Steal $600, go to jail for almost four years. And American workers, they may not know these statistics, but they, we all know and sense and feel this unfairness of the system. And as a, as a result of this kind of experience, that there's a tremendous level of discontent and anger that's building up in American society, particularly amongst working class people. I've been very active in helping to uh, organize for this meeting, and it's been a real uh, eye-opener for me as far as distributing leaflets and seeing the response that we've gotten. And this meeting is only the tip of the iceberg as far as uh, what, the, what the potential for support is. I'd like to give just a couple of examples. Just yesterday morning, I was leafleting in front of the BART station in downtown San Francisco, and an older guy, a security guard, looked like he was about 60, took a leaflet, walked halfway down the block, 
came back to me after he'd been reading the leaflet, said, listen, I'd like to get another 20 of these leaflets or so. I think what you're doing is a great thing, and I want to distribute them to my fellow union members. He was a union uh, security guard. Another woman, another person, a woman that we just happened to run into, she's a member of the Teamsters, and we showed her the leaflet. She, she said, yeah, I can hand some out at work. Incidentally, almost without exception, any union worker we had a chance to talk to was willing to take extra copies of the leaflet to hand out at work. She said, well, I'll take 20 or so. I think that's about all I can get rid of. I called her up yesterday morning. She said, I don't know what happened. They're all gone. She said, I had people coming up to me and asking me for leaflets. They said, I heard you were handing out some leaflet. I'd like to get one. This is the kind of response that we've been getting. Also, incidentally, uh, it's been very interesting to me, you know, all this propaganda you hear about the unions are dead, nobody cares about the unions anymore. Well, you know, in the Bay Area, there's leaflets distributed on every conceivable topic, and a lot of workers are understandably a bit jaded. And lots of times you uh, try to hand out a leaflet, and if you'd, a and we distribute them mostly at the uh, union work sites, and people would, uh, uh, many people would not want to take one. And if you'd ask them, are you a union member? they'd turn around and say, oh, yeah, okay, and take a leaflet. This is true for, from nurses to construction workers. Almost invariably, when they heard this had something to do with the labor movement, they wanted to read it. And it just shows the tremendous uh, uh, um, attraction that the, these traditional organizations of the workers, the trade unions, that it holds for workers today, despite all the lies and propaganda of big business that they get every day off of the media and all. And I think that it's very, very positive what Brother Mazaki is doing, coming here and speaking on the question of a, of a labor party. And what it shows the, in organizing for this meeting, what it shows is that if only the union leadership in, in general would take up this campaign and just would just le lift the least little finger, the absolutely massive response that they would get, they would literally fill the Oakland Coliseum. I think there's no doubt, and that's, I'm not saying that for rhetorical purposes. I think there's no doubt about it. And of course, we had the same problem in the past as far as building the unions with the failure of the, of the AFL leadership back in the, in, the, in the early 30s and the 1920s. And that failure was overcome. And it will be overcome again in the future. And you can see the process of overcoming that failure at work already. If you just take, for instance, a couple, of, uh, a couple more figures, the rate of profit over the last 20 years or so has declined from 17% down to 8%. That was, I believe, in uh, 1987. And the solution of big business to this problem is in the words of the Vice President of Goodyear Tires, literally, he said, we have to get the real wages in America down much closer, closer to the Brazils and Koreas. Brother Mazaki uh, uh, alluded to that statement. And as a result, you've seen over the last 14 or 15 years, real wages have, de have declined by 15%. And this has hit the youth particularly hard. One study said that today's generation of youth can expect to earn 25% less than the generation of 10 years ago. So to every young person here in the hall, I would just say, take an older cousin, an uncle, and a friend of yours who's 10 years older than you, and find out what they're making. And then you subtract 25% of that, and that's what you can expect to make in your, uh, in your future years. They also predicted that there'll be 20 million youth standing on the corner with, as they put it, with no productive role to play in society, no job and no hope of ever finding a job. And you can see out of that the mass movement that will be arising out of these kinds of conditions. The miners' strike that's going on right now is a perfect example. And what happened out of that? They put forward a, a member of their own to run for office. And despite the fact that he was a write-in candidate, he got elected for office in just a very, very short time. This is an example. Uh, this is just an outline of, of, the, of, uh, of the future. And just to conclude, many people in this hall will be involved in such mass campaigns. Many people that today, sitting here in this hall, have no intention of getting involved in anything like this, that they themselves will be, would be utterly astounded if they could see what they'll be doing in five, ten years, or maybe even a lot less time from that uh, in the future. And it'll be arising out of that kind of massive movement that an unstoppable movement for a labor party will be built in America. And I think that that's what this meeting here represents in its outlines. Just, I was just concerned.
concerned about the fact that. Okay, I'm Joe Ryan. I'm in this Bible for. Get the mic. It's the question. I don't know why I have to move to the mic. Okay. I'm in Painters Local 4, and the name is Joe Ryan, but I'm speaking as an individual and as a socialist. And the question I have for Tony is, and I enjoyed your speech very much, is concerning the question of the elections. I think the only way for even uh, something that's just the beginning of a movement on a local level to begin to be addressed seriously and to be taken seriously by working people is to run for office. And by running for office, then, of course, you have to formulate a program. And I was a bit disturbed, and that's my question, is, is that why do you preclude from the beginning that we will not be an electoral organization at first? Now, a labor party should be a party that's active every month of the year, 365 days a year, and involved in all the social struggles and strikes that take place. But in the last analysis, they have to contend with the Republicans and the Democrats for power, and that means running inside the elections based on a program. And I think that should be addressed. Well, we, we come from different places. My experience tells me that organizing a party is a formidable task, and it's a serious task. And uh, you just can't form, I, you can't form a party overnight and run for elections. The whole history of third party movements in this country that are built around the electoral process is losing an election and the party collapses. Uh, it's a whole history of it. Uh, it usually is built around an individual with a, a program that's developed by a few individuals, and it's been a series of collapses. My experience, and I'm certainly I'm speaking from my experience, and putting out my proposal for adoption, is that building a party is serious business. And my own organizing experience tells me, you don't go against the biggest entity, collective corporate power in America, and do it in a frivolous manner. Uh, building a party, requires resources, it requires time, it requires thought, it requires strategic planning. That's a whole development. And uh, in Canada, our brothers and sisters, who uh, I'm familiar with the development of that party, it, they took their time, and they traveled the same road. And in Britain, the same road was traveled. This, this is serious business. You're up against, you're up against powerful forces, you're up against incredible amounts of, of money. And uh, I'm not about to stick my head out and have somebody sledge it down simply because I want to be a flash in a pan. I don't want to be that. This is serious. Uh, elections will come in time. It's a question of strategic planning. I have had my brains breed out, and I use that as a, a metaphor, uh, in strikes uh, that weren't planned that well. And also strikes that I think uh, we entered into uh, without properly assessing the power of the boss. Uh, those experiences mean something to me. The biggest boss of all is what we're up against. I propose that the time will come for elections, but that's in the future. Sister right here. Yeah, I'm Millie Phillips with IBW Local 1245 and the San Francisco Clue Executive Board. I want to say, first of all, I definitely support a Labor Party. I want to do anything I can toward furthering that goal. It's about time we had a discussion like this, and I'm really glad we're having it. I do want to say something I disagree with a little bit with a brother who said we had to build a rank-and-file movement first before we do that. I think the building toward a Labor Party would ins help inspire the building of a rank-and-file labor movement even more than there exists presently. I think both can be done and should be done simultaneously and would help build each other. I, I think it is good that uh, Mr. Mazaki has called for uh, leadership to, of the unions to help uh, organize this. The problem I see with that is that for people of my age, and I think there's a lot of my generation in this audience as well as Tony's generation, the key to union leadership, the test of union leadership, is your loyalty to the Democratic Party. And if you're not loyal to the Democratic Party, you will never become union leadership in a formal uh, uh, sense, appointed electoral sort of sense. And I think in that sense, it does have to come out of the rank and file to a large extent. We're going to have to start looking at building those two movements simultaneously. Um, I also wish to challenge a little bit what he's saying about the elections again. Personally, 
given my previous experience politically, I'm against token campaigns. And I do think you have to organize a, a, a serious effort and have a program before you run for office. However, at the same time, I think there are definite exceptions to that. And, and one is, of course, the case that Mr. Ryman mentioned about the UMWA candidate. When you have a struggle in which you have the possibility of electing a candidate directly, I think that's really positive. And I, I don't think that we should hold back on that. I think that when there, are, when there is a base for running independent political candidates, even without a party, that that should be done. And in most cases, those will end up being token campaigns, I suppose. But in some cases, like the Stump uh, case in the MWA, those are serious campaigns. And I don't think that they should be looked down upon. I'd like to hear Mr. Mizaki comment how he feels particularly about that campaign and campaigns of those types. I also would like to add one additional thing, which I think the brother over here mentioned earlier that I do agree with, which is that I think we have to expand this beyond the organized labor movement. Um, thanks to the, the government, Democratic and Republican parties, but also to the labor movement's leadership, we aren't the majority of the working population, and we, we would, if we limited it to organized labor, we'd be disenfranchising at least 85% of the population, and that includes all the people who used to be in unions who have lost their jobs, and I think that would be seriously wrong. I, I think such a party should be based on the resources and strength and leadership of the organized labor movement, but it should be open on a membership basis to, to anyone who supports this program is willing to work in it. Thank you. My name, my name is Carol Richardson. I'm a member of Local One, that's a public employees union, Contra Costa County. I've been involved in the labor movement for um, almost 30 years. I think it's a real misnomer to refer to uh, organized labor as organized. They're, any, they're anything but organized. If, if in fact they were organized, they wouldn't have let happen what happened to the um, the, uh, the, the folk from uh, the, uh, what was the guys who watched the planes come in? That would not have happened, nor would what's happening all over, the, over this country, where uh, laboring people are being uh, uh, systematically uh, isolated and, 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 uh, and they're losing their effectiveness. So it's a misnomer, first of all, to refer to this movement as organized labor. It's not organized, and in some, some sense, it's not even labor. It's, it's in my... In my opinion, what, one of the things that has contributed to, to the demise of, of, of uh, so-called organized labor is that we have lost our soul. Instead of uh, pursuing the high ideals of the 30s or when uh, the labor union was at its uh, apex, they have uh, pursued the uh, larger car, the larger house, the larger paycheck, and in fact have become an, an extension of, of um, big business. So. If we have anybody to blame for our demise, we have ourselves to blame for it. And, and it all, another thing is that a lot of the young folk who are here don't have any sense of the history that has, has uh, come before you. So there's a big gap. It, it, it's, it, it strikes me that there's no... It's, it's interesting that we, at a, at a local museum, we don't have an exhibit for labor, you know, that, that depicts uh, the contributions of labor. We don't have labor institutes that I'm aware of, and they, they might have them. And that we should have labor institutes. We should have, uh, unions should be organized in, in, in getting affordable housing for people who don't have it. You have to start, you have to forget about just the uh, paycheck stuff. You gotta start uh, appealing to people's uh, real, you know, the, the real uh, blood and guts of what they are about. And it's not all about it's not always about making money. I hope if, if that's what it's about, then I'm not interested in, in, a, in that kind of a union. I'm interested in something that, um, that says to every person who wants to work that you have a, you, you have a job. People who want to have, a, who will, everybody should have a house or at least uh, some place to lay their heads. We shouldn't have all the homeless people that we have now. It's, it's ridiculous that one of, the, one of the richest countries in the, in the world now has uh, huge number of people who are out in the street, uh, just homeless and women and children. It's, it's, it's atrocious. I'm getting out of the periphery of what we're talking about, but essentially any 
kind of uh, movement that we form ought to be based on some, some really high principles and not just on a bigger paycheck. Yeah, I'd just like to say one thing, we're going to carry on, but I'd just like to say one thing I meant to say at the beginning. My local, actually my local 444 and others that have endorsed this meeting and put some money into this, it's cost us over $1,000. Some of us have put our own money into it. So we, a member of my local is going to pass a can, pass it along the chit rows. And we'd like you, if you could, to uh, donate, uh, put some money in there toward this. And the other, the other thing is, is that if you could go to your union uh, and also and help us by getting a donation from your union toward this meeting. Anything that might be left over will be used in the, uh, in, in the follow-up meetings. Right now we're about 600 in debt, so, or I am, so, you know, if you can help, particularly if you go to your unions. Sister at the back. Uh, I, I really didn't want to engage in, in a programmatic discussion. Uh, certainly, uh, our union's position on a national health care will be discussed in a different forum. I really came here tonight to engage in a discussion about uh, my proposal and the proposal of others about the formation of a Labor Party. So uh, it's not that I want to answer it. I just don't think it's the appropriate place to discuss that program. That should be part of a general program that I hope would evolve out of a political party. Right, right behind. Right. Um, my name is Steve Kessler. I'm a former organizer for 1199 in New Jersey. I'm uh, currently uh, unorganized and I'm uh, uh, working with uh, homeless uh, people, victims of the earthquake. And uh, so when the previous speaker mentioned about addressing the homeless, that uh, really uh, hits home to me. And I think that there's going to be a, a, a moral fervor about dealing with, with those folks who, who've been um, really dispossessed. And um, I have a specific uh, suggestion about that. Um, and that is, um, whereas I, I tend to agree about uh, having labor uh, candidates marginalized or defeated and, and maybe seriously defeated to the point where we can never get everything off the ground in uh, electoral efforts. I do think um, initiatives um, would be good to follow uh, in the states that allow them. I think there's 22, maybe 24 states, including, of course, California. And having participated in a number of them uh, and being involved in one uh, projected for 92 uh, around workers' compensation, um, I think that um, a, um, a burgeoning labor party would uh, do well to do that. One of the advantages is so we can address groups who haven't made the commitment to a labor party, but programmatically that would agree with us, like the Rainbow Coalition, perhaps uh, the National Organization of Women, who's, who's talking about a party. Now, these aren't necessarily working class uh, in uh, their, their leadership or character, but on the other hand, these are organizations who represent people who are workers and people will have to win over. Uh, and they are disaffected from the Democratic Party. And then my final comment, uh, actually two, is one, right now the Democrats in uh, California, including Tom Hayden, are speaking against the initiative process. They want to restrict it considerably. So given you know, the rottenness of um, the parties in, in this state, it's one of the only political expressions that people have, although it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be for good purposes. And also, uh, I would uh, like some consideration about the possibility of nonpartisan elections uh, like those for city council and mayor for uh, labor candidates. But my main interest is uh, on initiative, and I hope Tony and other people comment. Uh, Tom Boot asked me 3211, clerical worker UC Berkeley, and also an organizer for the Freedom Socialist Party. Um, I'm really encouraged by your talk and also by the people here tonight that not only need, do we need the discussion, but we need such an, um, a vehicle for workers now. And a couple of points that I wanted to stress was that I do see it as necessary as also being outside of the trade union movement, simply because of the fact that the union movement 
in many ways, the union bureaucracy has really uh, made people cynical, has made millions of people lose faith in, in, the, uh, in the labor movement per se. One of the things that I think is very key to the formation also of the Labor Party is the whole idea of democracy. That democracy as we know it does not exist in the labor movement, that the majority of the workers, the rank and file, are their demands, and I mean the majority of the workers are people of color, women, and other especially oppressed workers like lesbian and gays, those people's, their demands are kept down and not paid attention to basically by the labor bureaucrats who do, do not want to take up their demands. So I think that democracy is a key and that any labor party has to be representative of the most specially oppressed workers uh, that I've mentioned and that I would hope to think that we can take this further tonight in some ways other besides our discussion. Three more speakers, brief and please. Well, I, my name is Steve Zeltzer. I'm a member of Operating Engineers Local 39, and also I uh, do labor videos, labor video project. Um, I want to say, first of all, thanks, Brother Mizaki, for coming and speaking to us today. Uh, the Bay Area, there was a coalition called Bay Area Coalition for Labor <coughs> Party um, in 1980-81 that formed to try to educate and propagandize around the issue of a labor party. Um, and uh, one of the problems is uh, with that that I saw was that just talking about a labor party and even talking about the program of a labor party uh, still leaves the absent the question, who are your candidates? And that's what workers want to know if they approach the elections. If they are looking for an alternative, they want to know who your candidate is. So uh, unless there's some kind of view towards having workers candidates, labor candidates, you're going to run into a, a contradiction. Uh, and a big one. The other thing is the question of the ideological struggle. I don't believe in the United States that you're going to have a labor party going around the AFL-CIO leadership. In other words, Lane Kirkland and the trade union leadership have a vested interest in staying in the Democratic Party. Now, that doesn't mean uh, that you should, there can't be a movement built, and I support the movement built of committees or a publication and, and related to state bodies, but you're going you're to come into a, an ideological conflict. And one of the sharpest areas that that's going to come on is how is the working class going to defend itself in particular struggles, like PATCO. Should the machinists have gone out and shut down the airlines when the PATCO workers went out? Or Eastern Airlines, why haven't the rest of the unions gone out and acted together collectively to back the Eastern strikers? These are real questions. And when you raise those questions, then you come into a very sharp conflict with a section of the trade union leadership, the majority, who don't want to challenge the capitalists, who don't want to challenge big business, to say we've got to go along with their laws. We've got to accept their injunctions because there's nothing we can do. And it seems to me you're not going to get around that ideological issue um, simply by forming labor party committees or simply by having a, labor, uh, a, a newspaper for a labor party, which I'm in support of. Um, so that's something that has to be addressed. Now, the, the last thing in, in regards to that, and I see it as a weakness, for example, in your campaign for a labor party, which I support, as a matter of fact, and you have the whole thing with Exxon. I mean, in this stinking country, you can't move oil from one place to another without it flooding out in the water. You can't have a, a refinery without having major explosions all over the United States. The oil companies are criminal and can't be held, they can, they're not responsible to, tr to refine and, and, and ship fuel. Now, when we had the Exxon spill, uh, I think it was incumbent on those people who wanted to see a labor party or the ideas of a labor party to raise the issue of why should Exxon have the right to move oil, to own this oil? What business do they have being in the oil business? And the question of nationalization of the oil industry and nationalization of Exxon and the uh, under workers' control, community control, or at least the jailing of these executives. Now, I didn't hear anything. I didn't hear anything from the unions in this country to, to address that question. And a lot of people, people who aren't in the unions, were saying, we've got to get radical. I mean, a lot of them said, tear up your Exxon cards. That's, of course, a, it'll just go to another oil company. But the fact of the matter is people want action. They hate it when the environment is being destroyed. And if the trade union movement is serious about addressing the question of a labor party, it's got to say concretely, this is how we do it. And that's the way I see the movement towards the labor party. And that's, those are some of the things I think have to be addressed. Thank you.
My name is uh, Robert O'Neill. I'm a former member of the National Executive of the Irish Labour Party and also a member of the Plasterers Union in Ireland. I now live in the United States and I'm very happy to participate in the struggle for the Labour Party here. But I would like to just first of all say on my own, on my own behalf, but I think I, I speak on behalf of the meeting to congratulate Local 444 for holding this meeting. This is a meeting to break the monopoly of big business over American politics. And Local 444 have shown by organizing this meeting that they are in the forefront. They are the most advanced local in California and in some ways throughout the United States at the present time and taken up this crucial question. I believe if we're going to succeed in building a Labour Party, we need to learn the lessons from history. Brother Mazaki spoke of these lessons in his own experience. Brother Richard spoke of the lessons also of history. But I think there are other lessons. There are lessons of the brothers and sisters throughout the world. One of the important qualities that a labor activist has to have is an imagination. We are sitting in this hall tonight. Throughout the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, there are tens of millions of workers and young people who haven't been able to lift their head for 40 years who are now crushing dictatorship after dictatorship of the Stalinist bureaucrats in those countries. Yeah. I believe this meeting should send a support to those workers because they're fighting for the same thing as we are fighting for, independent trade unions, their own political parties and democratic rights. Yeah. But I also feel that we have to learn the lessons from those workers and we have to take these lessons into our union branches and we have to put them on the table in front of the union leadership and tell them what is going on. Because if those workers can bring down the powerful military dictatorships of East Europe and the Soviet Union, then the American working class can defeat big business, bring down the Bush government and establish its own Labour Party. That is the main lesson for us of Eastern Europe. We aren't restricted. We can have this meeting. Two months ago in East Germany, we, the workers could not have had a meeting like this. We'd be all arrested. But two months later, they brought down the government. Now, how did they do it? They went on the streets, and there are millions. They demonstrated. They went on general strike, and they forced the government to retreat Re resignations. And now the president is actually under house arrest. we got to say to the labor leaders in this country, the working class has the power. Brother Mizaki, I agree with him 100%. We have to respect the power of the bosses. But I also say we have to understand the power of the working class. We are, par we are more powerful. We are more powerful than the bosses. They all go on their holidays. In fact, they do practically no work, and people don't even notice that they're missing. But if we take the day off, the country stops. We have the power. And that's the main lesson of Eastern Europe. And the way to succeed in the Eastern strike and the way to succeed in the UMW strike is to do with the East European workers. General strikes, mass demonstrations, and take on the government. Incidentally, I believe we should take note of something. It's very interesting from the point of view of this meeting, is that in Eastern Europe, they are not one-party dictatorships. In East Germany, there were three, there were three before the dictatorship was defeated, there were three political parties. And in all the East European countries, not the Soviet Union, there was more than one legal political party. But the problem was that the bureaucratic dictatorship controlled all the parties. Now in America, there are two political parties. <laughs> but it's exactly the same, only instead of the bureaucratic dictatorship doesn't exist here, the dictatorship of big business controls the two political parties. So in actual fact, on that question, there's not that much difference. And what we are fighting for is to br break the monopoly that big business has over American politics so that we, the working class, can have our own party. And that's what this uh, meeting is about. And those are the lessons, in my opinion, we have to learn. And in relation to the Democrats, probably everybody here agrees the Democrats are big business party, but we need to restate the Democrats and Republicans operate on the basis of American industry operates, that is, division of labor. 
When the working class are going forward, big business puts the Democrats there to suck them in to their political system. When the working class are being driven back, the Republicans are given the, the whoop, drive them back even further. And the only difference between the Republicans and the Democrats, the Republicans say, I'm going to cut health spending by $100 million. The Democrats said, no, under no conditions, we're only going to agree to cut it by $99.5 million. <laughs> And this is the way they play the game. And the Labour leaders go along with that, with the exception of Brother Mazzaghi. And they say to the workers, you see, do you want 100 million or 99.5 <laughs> Now, I'd like to just go on and make one final point in relation to this, about what we are uh, fighting for. Many, many uh, Labour leaders raise the question, just a detail in passing, you can't have a Labour Party in this country because it's not a parliamentary system. They'd get any argument to stop fighting for the Labour Party. Well, in Brazil, they have exactly the same political system, a presidency and a legislature. In 1980, there was a steel strike, a metal worker strike in Sao Paulo. At the end of the strike, the workers formed their own political party, the Workers' Party, it's called. They put up their candidate, Lula, in the election, and he's now on a runoff with a reasonable chance of being the president of Brazil nine years later. This is in Brazil, under a dictatorship. We guys throw out this nonsense you can't have a Labour Party in this country because of a parliamentary system. And the final thing I would say is about the programme. Because I believe it is important that we clarify the programme as we struggle for the Labour Party. But I also believe it's necessary to qualify that, that whatever the nature of its programme, a Labour Party in America is a major step forward. If you take the unions, the unions in America at the present time, I don't agree with the programme. What's the programme? Make concessions to the bosses. I don't agree with that program. But yet, if we had no unions, it would be an absolute catastrophe. And if we build a party of the Labour, a party of Labour, based on the unions, even if its program is concessions to the bosses, that's still a huge step forward. Because we have something to join, fight through, and in every election, big business has to decide what are they going to do and kiss everybody boots for the Labour Party. Changes the balance of forces. However, I do believe a program is important. And I just state the program finally. The program that I would fight for is a $10 an hour minimum wage for everybody, a 32 hour work week, a free health service, cost of living adjustment for everybody, free uh, childcare for everybody. And in these terrible dictatorships of Eastern Europe, it's very interesting. In East Germany, everybody has free childcare, even under a dictatorship. We haven't advanced that far in the United States. <laughs> I also feel we need to fight for free education and housing for everybody, like the brothers and sisters and said. But the, the question comes up then, how are we going to get it? Big business is not going to get it, not going to give it to us. We're going to have to take it from them. And if we start taxing them to tax their profits and all, what are they going to do? Close down the factories, close down the money, and they'll take it somewhere else. So I believe we have to come up against this thorny question of the private ownership of the means of production, distribution and exchange in America. The 500 corporations in America, they are a dictatorship over America. We never elect the board of directors. We don't even know the boards of directors, and they run the country. I feel the program of the Labour Party has to be nationalisation of the 500 corporations under workers' control and workers' management and a plan of production on a democratic socialist basis. Now, of course, the Red Scare will come up. It's a very simple answer to them. When the SNLs went bust, what did they do? He went to the SNLs and he said, well, all these crooks have been robbing the SNLs. You shouldn't have done that, you're bad boys. Then they turned to the working class and they said, what? You're going to have to pay $300 billion to bail them out. And what they did with the SNLs, they took the ones that were bankrupt, and we should use this word, they nationalized the debt of the SNLs. Wasn't any ratted scare against the Democrats or Republicans. <laughs> the Labour leaders should have launched a scare against the Democrats and Republicans. They should have said, you are nationalising the debts, make an oath pay the debts, and the ones that are not bust, they give them back to the private sector. So we say, if it's good enough for the bust ass and else, it's good enough for the 500 corporations. <laughs> I want to bring my remarks back to Tony Mizaki uh, and his proposal 
to start a discussion for a Labour Party. Now, I know many of the people here today are very frustrated because they've been thinking that all their lives, so to speak. Most of them, I suppose, from a socialist point of view. Now, I want to make an analogy, but first I want to say I came today because Tony Masaki was going to be here. Now, I'm not one who generally is in support of labor bureaucrats. Tony happens to be one. Now, that's important for him to come here and talk about a labor party. Now, think about it for a moment. A national leader of a large union addresses the labor party issue. He's a pariah on this subject in the trade union movement. Now, that's what the important part of his presence is here. And those who think they can step outside of the trade union movement and organize a labor party have got something to learn. It doesn't happen that way. It'll never happen that way. A labor party will come out of the labor movement. And there will be no other way a labor party can be built. And that has to be understood. And for Mazaki to run around the country advocating a labor party in his particular formula, and it's not important about his particular formula, what is important that he is doing it among trade unionists who are not doing it. Yeah. All right, now I want to draw a historical conclusion for a moment. Now there were leaders in America who were for industrial unionism long before the CIO. Daniel De Leon, very early socialist. That was his whole program. Uh, Eugene Debs, that was his whole program. He wanted industrial unions and through that a new society could be built. But you know when we finally succeeded in organizing millions of American industrial workers? when a rotten scoundrel took up the cudgels, John L. Lewis. He was a rotten bum who actually killed progressive socialist miners, was in the process of doing so. And yet when he took up the schedule, the, the idea of an industrial union, he broke the union in half, took out the CIO, and it took that break in the formal trade union movement, as lousy as it was then, to create the idea that here was a movement that people could join. And I tell you, a labor party will be built that way. The Mazakis, he's only a forerunner, a precursor of what is to come. I think at the end of the year, if we read the strike statistics, we're going to be shocked. I think this was probably the largest year of strikes in probably 20 years. It's true we didn't win them all, but we didn't lose them all either. In other words, there is an undercurrent of this declining of our standard of living, the declining of our welfare that's beginning to well up. And it first comes in strike waves. That's what came in 34 in the three general strikes that the brother referred to. It's not a new phenomena. It takes time. <laughs> Those of us who are too much of a hurry to say, oh, you've got to have the program, you've got to be a socialist, you've got to have all the answers, are making a mistake. What is necessary is to put a heat on the bureaucrats to do as Mazaki is indicating to us. I'm Marge Clauser from Communication Workers. I work as a clerk at the phone company. And I think this is an incredible event tonight, and I am so excited that it's the beginning, I, can, I am sure, you know, of future meetings like this all around the country. Um, I think on the question of uh, 
whether it whether the labor party should run candidates is kind of maybe this seems to me artificial to say at the beginning no not until that big day in the future sometime i think it'll come naturally that is for instance what if this meeting was a meeting of that labor party and there was a candidate at an election here in oakland we would you know at the practice that workers need in, in finding a candidate and uh, and electing them is, is uh, sort of an organic thing that should start as, as soon as possible. Uh, on the question also, the brother, one of the brothers brought up about, you know, the terrible battles that we've been having over these so many years, the unions on the defensive constantly, the air traffic controllers, the Greyhound, the Hormel meat packers, Eastern Airlines, Pittston coal strike, 9X strike. It seems to me that the reason we're in these battles and so forth is precisely because for so many years, the labor bureaucracy in the United States labor leadership has put off, has not uh, felt it's the time is right, et cetera, et cetera. And therefore, we are faced with the labor laws still there, and that's why these battles are happening. Um, I think whether a labor party can or cannot be built within the next five years depends not on how formidable the corporations are, but on, on how formidable the trade union leadership is. I think uh, that the leadership a leadership that's very clear about the perspectives and regarding the process of class struggle, of history of the nature, uh, uh, the history of this class struggle, the nature of the, econo the economic and political system we have, uh, and that we're presently under, and the insoluble contradictions in that system, which means the inability of the two parties to solve the crisis. If that is firmly in the mind of the leadership and they understand that, that means that the alternative, that it is a nece necessity that the alternative system uh, be built and that a labor party as the first transition to that is, is, is built. But um, we've got great trade union leaders in this country. I have great respect uh, for a lot of them. But the big problem for us, you know, in the future is going to be, you know, uh, somewhere that break has to happen so that the trade union leadership um, uh, takes us forward toward the labor party. Back up with some and well, I certainly appreciate, you know, the expressions I've heard here tonight, and certainly it's not the first time I heard many of them. And uh, we all speak uh, based on our own analysis of uh, the problems and the forces that exist. Uh, I um, choose to work within the framework of the trade union movement. Uh, I think you have to be very careful about characterizations. This is a very diverse movement. There's a lot of activity from a middle level on down. There's all sorts of struggle. I meet a hell of a lot of good trade union leadership on a local and regional level. I meet people who, uh, I meet really good people who struggle hard uh, and want to stand for the right thing. Uh, so I, you got to be very careful about broad characterizations. I, come from a union that I feel is democratic. I've been knocked out of the box. Uh, uh, I lay my views before my membership. I run for elections. No one can say they didn't know what I stood for. And uh, defeat's not the worst thing in the world. Uh, I tell my fellow trade unions who've never suffered it, you know, Bill's character. You ought to try it once in a while. Uh, uh, nobody has to tell me what the rank and file's like. I just spent eight years among the rank and file. That's where I went. So uh, I, I take second place to no one in uh, what the rank and file is thinking and what they're doing. My expressions grow out of the last eight years. I lost the race for president, see, in my union in 1981. And I spent uh, seven years out among the rank and file. And uh, I know just precisely what's going on. I saw the views that I expressed in 1981 come true. In fact, I went back and read my campaign speech and impressed the ass off of me because I didn't realize how predictive it was. That, that was that was a fluke. Uh, I would like to tell you it came out of profound analysis, but it was hunch and intuition, and uh, you know a lot of people had these intuitions, and it came to pass, unfortunately. So uh, I, I wouldn't uh, just wipe out uh, the trade union movement. There is more openness for discussion, and. Uh, there are places to be critical of it, and I'm critical of it. I, I operate within this movement. If you think you have it tough, uh, you go to an afl CEO executive council meeting in a convention like I go to and, uh, and have to deal uh, with uh, my brothers and sisters who have diverse views from me. So, you know, um, 
It's, I don't live in an unreal world either. Uh, these are comfortable. You know, to be a union bureaucrat is a very comfortable position. And I can tell you, uh, I've won and I've lost, and it's a hell of a lot better to win. And life is easier on top than the bottom. And that's the reality uh, of our existence. However, uh, uh, what I'm proposing is what I'm proposing. And uh, I am appealing to those who see this proposal as having validity and want to work within the framework of the proposal. For those who don't, I respect your opinions, I respect your views, and you want to do what you think you should do to advance um, the interest of working people. And hell, uh, I'm not proud. Somebody has something that sets this country on fire, I'd like to win one time in my lifetime, and I'm going to be right there following the crowd uh, uh, in, in mounting the barricades of America. Uh, I, I think uh, the proposal I've put out, I've tested among a lot of rank and file leadership. I've tested it on a lot of regional l leadership, and they're prepared to go. And uh, whether they go or not, we'll soon know. Uh, as you know, we take this dog and pony show across the country. Uh, we'll see whether uh, people are prepared to move. I believe there's an opportunity to present itself before. I don't want to miss the opportunity. Uh, to take advantage of the moment. I think it's there, and uh, those who believe in it, fine. Uh, I think uh, you ought to let us know who you are, and we'll be calling upon you. Those who, who think there are other roads, listen, as I said, uh, I, I wish you the best of success, and uh, I have enough uh, to do rather than going down and shooting down everybody else's proposal. I've learned to uh, have a lot of respect for people's opinions. Uh, I've lived long enough to know that most of the times we're wrong. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, life is full of a hell of a lot of mistakes, but uh, uh, there's also those moments that you sense that you can be successful. I've, you know, I, I spent some time, uh, we're, in, we're in a process of talking merger with the mine workers, and I hope uh, we're able to accomplish that in our union. I, I'm a proponent of that. Uh, I've got a lot of respect. I see the struggle of the miners. Uh, been down at Pittston, and uh, uh, like many of you, and uh, you know, some of the brothers and sisters mentioned Stump. You know, the one, you know, he won on a write-in vote. But listen, it's like stepping off onto another planet when you go into mine country, and you ought to be. You have to be realistic. I mean, where in the hell do you go where you've seen signs we don't serve state police here, and where every business has a sign in a window we support the UMWA. That's a whole culture. That's a different country. It's a different planet. And when you live in a place where 99% of the people, your brothers and sisters, in a struggle, and you say, we're going to write my name in, it's a hell of a lot different than being in the Bay Area or somewhere else. So, you know, you've got to very carefully analyze these situations. You know, uh, and this, the miners are conducting, you know, a gallant struggle. And, uh, that situation, there's a lot of fight left in people. And uh, there's a lot of fight. You don't want to lead them down the, the, the primrose path either. I mean, hell, we've been through enough of serious defeats over the past years. So I want to close on a note, again emphasizing, the formation of a party is serious business. It's not frivolous. We shouldn't be frivolous with people's lives. It's got a responsibility uh, when you attempt to lead a movement, not to lead people down a path in, in a way that's not responsible. You're dealing, uh, you're dealing with a hell of a lot of lives. And uh, it's one thing to lead people and get beat. I mean, we've all done that. And we've all been in losing causes. But I, uh, my proposal grows out of, uh, uh, not to suggest that anyone else doesn't think about these things seriously, it, it's based on an analysis. What I see is present out there in the labor movement. Uh, some opportunities. And listen, if you think you can tell some bad stories about what you see going on, uh, we can play, can you top this some night? But that's not the point. The fact of the matter is there, there's a whole hell of a lot of people out there uh, who will respond to uh, a direction that makes some sense to them. And programs, hell, you know, we could spend nights on programs. I have my own that I think we could lay out there. I think we need to create the spaces so we can argue what that program should be. I think that's the first step. What type of organizational structure where we can conduct the discussion about what that program should be. And uh, that's step number one. 
So I want to end on this note. One is a proposition out there. We're inviting people to be part of it. And I say organized labor because that's a first step. Sure, there's a big community out there. It's 110 million people who work or potentially can work for wages. It's a hell of a lot of people. And there are, there are over 12 or 13 million, maybe 15 million people, members of organized labor with resources. You know, incredible. I'm secretary treasurer of an international union. Uh, I know what resources mean. I know what it is to look at a million or a couple of million bucks uh, and other people with 10, 20, 30, 40, or 50 million. That, that's the type of resource that exists not to be built. So, you know, you carefully strategize on how you want to proceed. I'm proposed, my proposal is a serious one. I intend to move on it. Uh, you'll hear about it. Those of you who are members of organized labor who wish to be part of this, uh, certainly uh, I hope you leave your names. Uh, and you won't hear from us tomorrow morning. But you can carry on these discussions, and you will, you will hear from us in a not-too-distant future about it, an attempt to move this idea forward. Uh, these type of meetings have been held in a hell of a lot of places. And uh, I, I can tell you, I don't. I come out to speak before a meeting like this. I face my California brothers and sisters tomorrow morning and walk all over me because I'm presenting this idea. I don't, that doesn't bother me. I'm, I say, wherever I have an opportunity in my own union to get into an argument over this proposal, I welcome that opportunity. I'm not going to run from that because I think that's how we advance the issue. I got elected recently. The key component of my platform to my membership was, you know I stand for a Labor Party. You know if I get elected, I become the director of the Committee on Political Education of the Oil, Chemical, and Atomic Workers Union. And I interpret Committee on Political Education as to educate people about the need for a working people's party. I laid that out before my convention delegates. And they know when they voted for me, they voted that I would be here and speaking in places like this. And I'm prepared to, to deal with those consequences. They know about it. I don't believe in in laying something before people and then have a hidden agenda in coming forward. I think uh, American workers are, are willing to disagree and support people who stand for something. And I think we could resurrect this movement if we stand for something. And we have a vision, a vision, and a different vision, a different vision. I didn't get into, see, I, there are many things. I mean, one of the brothers talk about oil tankers and oil spills. Listen. Uh, I think the question of nature is central to any discussion we have in the future. I have to be one of those people who have to think we have about 10 years left to make some serious decisions on this planet. I don't say that frivolously. That's my opinion. We have 10 years in which to make serious decisions to alter the fate of the planet. Uh, I happen to think the situation is much more serious. I pay a great deal of attention to things like global warming. Uh, I think that it's, that will reshape that argument alone is going to reshape the way we produce things in a society, uh, or else there isn't going to be a planet. I used to think that was 100 years off. My timeline is much shorter than that. In order to have a discussion of how do we meet the challenges that are being posed to us, not only by society, but by nature, requires the type of formation that none of us even dreamed about. I believe that working people are the only ones capable of addressing the most serious issues that confront the globe and the planet. And for the first time, for the first time, uh, a lot of these solutions require global international labor solidarity. We can't talk about this question. I, I'm meeting with my trade, un trade union brothers all over the world and saying, you can, this is the, the question of carbon dioxide is not something to solve in the United States. It's something we can only solve in unison. You know, for the first time since the dawn of mankind, we have an issue that can unite us, these environmental issues. That's a subject for a whole programmatic approach of what this party stands for. The challenges are there. I think we're the only ones capable of addressing those challenges. Uh, the proposal I made is one that you will hear about. Uh, it, it may be altered in its final form after we have, we created the space so we can discuss it. So whatever comes out uh, programmatically after we create the spaces, hell, it'll come out of democratic discussion. So listen, I welcome the opportunity, and I thank uh, the brothers and sisters who sponsored this meeting. Uh, I think uh, this is an important, uh, an important event. Uh, 
I think it demonstrates that local unions, you know, when you talk about the labor movement, this is a local union that decided to uh, be a catalyst to holding a meeting. So, you know, there are a hell of a lot of good people out there. I believe you're part of them and your locals. People all over the country are willing to do the same thing. So, uh, I feel encouraged. Um, it's not going to be easy, but uh, I certainly welcome and appreciate the opportunity to uh, subjecting uh, myself uh, to your views, uh, which I consider important and take seriously. And uh, I uh, appreciate the opportunity you've provided me to articulate uh, my proposals. Uh, you will be hearing from us in one form or another. And as I say, those who agree with the proposal, we welcome you. Those who disagree, I, I, I wish you the best of success in your own endeavors. I know that uh, collectively we all stand for the same thing. Thank you. Brother. Thank you. I'd like to say again that uh, thank you, Brother Mazaki, for coming out and addressing us. We will have a follow-up meeting on December the 20th at Laney College, and that will be at 5 o'clock. And at the end of this meeting, I'd like to also say, I'd like to close this meeting with an adoption of resolution. This meeting recognizes the struggle of workers and youth in Russia and East Europe, South Africa, and the whole world. We call for the right to independent trade unions and for political parties of the working people throughout the world. And we're going to adopt that resolution. Can we have a vote on it? Somebody asked me to vote. Is there a second? Any questions? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? I'd like to thank all the brothers and sisters for coming out again tonight. Thank you.